All right, let's take a walk. Before we get going, make sure that you sign up for Quick Week, our weekly newsletter. I write an article there each week. Uh, talk about all things quick. You can go to quickmedia.com, that's C-W-I-C media.com to sign up for that. It's right at the top of the page. All right, our first topic then is patriarchy. It is God's patriarchy. God has a patriarchy. When you think about what patriarchy is, really, it is a hierarchical structure and it's order. Now, there are good patriarchies and there are bad patriarchies, but God's patriarchy is a good patriarchy. It's interesting that we get a lot of attacks toward that patriarchal structure, uh, toward at the brethren, right? Or at other leaders or at God himself without really understanding that there is an order, there is a patriarchal structure that God has put into place. And in fact, this I think is just, it's not something new, these attacks on this type of uh, structure. I, I think it's always gone on. And we can see this as something that is a big part of actually what launches the Book of Mormon is the attacks on God's patriarchy. So when we see what happens at the time of Lehi and Jeremiah in Jerusalem, we see a, a con, con, uh, consolidation of power that is going into Jerusalem. And all the high places are removed, the priests, a lot of the priests are murdered. The theology changes pretty drastically. And part of that has to do with this power grab uh, during the time of Jeremiah and Lehi. Secondly, the theology changes and does the same thing. It consolidates into one single God, who is Jehovah. Prior to that, you had a father, you had a mother, you had the son, and then you had others that would be part of what we would call a council that would have been represented oftentimes in visions from visionary men like Lehi. Remember that Laman and Lemuel call their dad a visionary man. Well, what are they talking about? It's not just his vain imaginations, things that he's thinking of. This is a specific title. Those visions are of God's patriarchy. You think about Isaiah 6 in the temple uh, vision that he has there with God on his throne and his long robe and the seraphim that are around him and the wings that are on the seraphim. There's all the, there's always this structure around the throne. Or if you go to the book of Revelation and you see God on his throne and you have the 24 elders that are around the throne. Constantly in the visions of these visionary men, they see this patriarchal structure, which involves us. It is a capsule of the premortal council in heaven that shows that there are many. Think about the titles, for example, of Eve. She is the mother of all living, right? It, it's multiple. Uh, in the book of Moses, Adam means man, but it also means many, we are told. The name of God, the Father, Elohim, is numerous gods or the council. It has to do with that idea of those visions and that structure that is put into place. So what is happening here at the time of Jeremiah? This, they're getting rid of the order. They're getting rid of the levels. They're getting rid of our involvement because we're part of that council. And it changes our identity. It changes our relationship with God. And that nature of God is important. It creates a different relationship with his children. And it, the, the, I call this the DBR, right? It is the order of God. It is the word of God. It's how the word travels down. And we get this over and over in the temple on how this works. We get the word going from God the Father to Jehovah to Michael, and then later from Elohim to Jehovah to Peter, James, and John, which are just a representation of the... Uh, messengers of God, then it comes to Adam and Eve, you know, that's, that's what it is. That's what's going on there. That is like the council in heaven. 
right? That's exactly what it, the structure is. And we see this as a major part of what launches the Book of Mormon. In 1st Nephi 1, the visionary man, Lehi, what does he see? He sees one of these visions. He has this structure given to him, which is God on his throne, 12 around him, and then concourses of angels. And so, again, this is a reaction to what is going on in Jerusalem at that time. Book of Abraham, the same thing. Why do we need this? What, is, what are... What are we getting from Joseph Smith through all these scriptures? We're getting a reintroduction to the loss of plain and precious things. So Abraham three is the same thing. It's simply a structure, a hierarchical structure of God and his order. And it's represented first by planets and we get Kolob and I always forget the second one, Olablish or whatever it is. And, and then Kokobeam, which are the stars. And this is a way of showing cosmologically how this order works. And then, of course, it goes down further in Abraham 3 and talks about the spirits and talks about Jehovah. And then you get Abraham in the council, in the pre-mortal world, as one of the great and noble ones. That would be one of those that is surrounding that throne. In the book of Moses, it's the same thing. Before the creation story starts, just like we had with Abraham. Abraham 3 is right before his creation story starts. Before the creation story starts, you get Moses looking at multiple worlds and all the works of God that he can't quite handle. So that is what is being replaced. And of course, again, back to Book of Mormon, chapter 1, uh, it is Lehi doing the same thing, seeing one of these visions. That's why he is a visionary man to Laman and Lemuel. He is bringing back the order, the patriarchy of God that has been removed. So when you think about those scriptures and that order and look at those visions, just remember that those are part of the plain and precious things that had been removed and needed to be restored. All right, so second topic, interfaith work. Last weekend, I went and visited now a popular evangelical pastor and had dinner with he and his wife. We had a great discussion as we have had many, many times. Talk about the things that are similar in our beliefs, in our doctrines, talk about things that are different. And you know, I'm not gonna move on my beliefs. He's probably not gonna move on his beliefs, but there is a work that is done there of building bridges that I believe is very important. And there's a strong spirit to me that that takes place with this type of work. It is not missionary work. <clears throat> I don't know that as a church we're that good at this. And there's good reason for it. I mean, we have been persecuted. We have been othered, um, called names. And, and so we're kind of used to backing ourselves into a corner and defending ourselves. And I get it. I, my whole YouTube channel is about defending faith. But I think we need to learn a little better how to work with interfaith communities. And especially when we find those who are willing to open up and work with us. I think that's really important. We need to move beyond where we have been in the past. We are in a new era. And, you know, I think that President Nelson's talk here on being peacemakers is very applicable. Had that dinner with uh, him and his wife that night. Um, long discussion again on, on these things. I've had many, many of those discussions with many different individuals and, and people of different backgrounds and faiths as I've tried to uh, bridge some gaps there with, with other other religions and, and people of other beliefs. The next day was an interfaith event. And in that interfaith event, you had evangelicals and Latter-day Saints speaking. And this was great. And, and it's not, again, it's not a missionary effort. But one of the original pastor's friends got up and gave a speech. He actually quoted 
the Book of Mormon. Now, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that he believes in the Book of Mormon. But he quotes Messiah, and he starts talking about uh, the natural man and putting off the natural man. And he said something that I thought was great and, and, and is in the spirit of interfaith work, right? He said, as he's talking about this and putting off the natural man, he says, uh, now, I don't read from the Book of Mormon and teach from the Book of Mormon as a pastor, but I do agree with that verse. And that is a good example of putting an olive branch out there. That is a good example of how to work with each other, especially considering he has a majority Latter-day Saint audience that he is speaking to. We are participants in Zion and not just in missionary work. There is goodness that can be done in many different ways. And just because someone is not going to become a member of the church, uh, what, what, I mean, think about one of the criticisms that we have in our missionary work, for example, is that you might go out and try to befriend, befriend someone, maybe they're involved with the missionaries, and then if they decide to turn it down, you know, you may not be a friend with them anymore. I'm not accusing you or me or anybody else, but that's a rap that we get sometimes. And I think we need to remember President Nelson's uh, identity hierarchy. Number one, we are all children of God. That's what we need to look at first. Second is that we're Latter-day Saints. We're children of the covenant. It's very important, right up there. And we don't want to forget that. And we want to defend the faith. And we want to participate. But number one is that we are a child of God and everyone is a child of God and we want to treat others as much as possible in that way and, and remember that when we are working with interfaith efforts. Not everything falls into missionary work. Anyway, just my random thoughts on that. I think that we can improve as Latter-day Saints on how we do interfaith work and, and put our arms around others that believe differently than we do. Lastly, and I don't do this very often, but I want to bear you my testimony, right? I know the gospel is true. The gospel is true. The church is true. And we should act that way. We can have confidence in the restoration. I've said this before, but, you know, I know this from three different ways. Number one, I know this from an intellectual standpoint. I have studied the scriptures for 35 years. Uh, I have studied history. I have studied philosophy. From an intellectual standpoint, the pieces of the puzzle fit into place very, very well. Not all of them, right? They don't all automatically fit in there. Sometimes they take some time to fit something in. But the pieces are all there. And I believe the more you study the scriptures, the more you will see that intellectually and understand that the gospel is true. Now, secondly, number two, I know this from experience. So, you know, in Alma 32, and, and this goes right along with the scientific uh, process, Alma asks us to try an experiment and it is exactly the same process as the scientific method we do exactly the same thing where we test it out see if it doesn't grow see what the result is going to be what is our personal it's not an observation with our eyes it is a an observation of how our life is and how things fall into place and I know this through experience. I have tested these principles many times. I know they work. And I know through experience that the gospel is true. Number three, and most importantly, I know this from spiritual confirmation. And taking everything that I know, bringing it to prayer, uh, being enlightened and feeling the spirit, I have a witness that the gospel is true. I hope we can all build those testimonies in a world right now where everything wants to be, it seems to be broken down. 
and we're breaking apart into ites and we're breaking down the structure of the patriarchy and the order of God and the attacks on the church and the brethren and the doctrine and the restoration of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and everything else that gets hurled against that goodness and that order. Remember the gospel is true. Thanks for taking a walk.